Amen. Well, we are going to be in the book of Luke. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up with me to the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 1 through 2, and then we're going to read verses 10 through 13. And it says, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose steward was accused of wasting his possessions. Come on, just say, don't waste it. So he called him and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. Come on, give an account of your stewardship. That is the word of the Lord for today. Give an account for your stewardship. Because you can no longer be a steward. Now go to verse 10. It says, whoever can be trusted with little can be trusted with much. So if you have not been trustworthy and handling worldly wealth, who can trust you with true riches? Come on, are you asking God for more? You haven't even been faithful over the little. If you have not been trustworthy over someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Come on, turn to your neighbor and just say, give account for your stewardship. As I was preparing, I really just felt grief. The grief of the Lord for the current condition of the church. And, you know, Apostle said it the other day when Bishop, he said that Bishop Bismarck told him that the American church has really fumbled the ball. You guys can have a seat. We're, we're, we're in there. That They have really fumbled the ball. And the reality is that is true for us. I felt the heart of God just grieved that we have not been trustworthy, that we have not proven ourselves trustworthy to handle with maturity and consistency the things that he's given us. It's been distractions. It's been busyness. Come on, sometimes it's our work schedules or our children. It's not always bad things or sinful things, but distractions have kept us from faithfully stewarding the things of God. It's been idolatry. Come on, how many hours a day do you spend on your phone scrolling? Scrolling versus how many hours a day do you spend on your knees in prayer? This is, this is where we're going to be the whole time. So if you're going to be mad at me, be mad at me now. But we have not been stewarding the things of God faithfully. And we can tell because all you have to do is look around. The creation is literally groaning. It's mourning for the sons of God. We have pandemics. We have pestilence. We have floods. We have fires from a whole other nation sending smoke here. We have not been on our assignment. We have not been carrying out what God has trusted to us with faithfulness. Even those of us who maybe have been, they say, well, well I'm serving. It's not with consistency. It's not with excellence. Come on, it's not with consistency. God is not here for the mediocre. Our God is a God of a standard. And we can't just bring any old thing, any old way to our God. He wants us to serve him and to serve him with faithfulness. Serve him with faithfulness. He's not looking for fickleness or double-mindedness or people who can be easily swayed or led by your emotions. You're here today. You're serving God. Tomorrow somebody hurt your feelings. You're no longer faithful anymore. We're not being good stewards of what God has given us. So we're not trustworthy. We're not trustworthy. We spend a lot of time trying to cultivate trust in, with relationships with people that we can see, with people, relationships with people we live with, with relationships with people we work with, with relationships with people who we think can bring elevation and promotion to us. But we don't spend enough time showing our faithfulness and our trustworthiness to the God of the universe. And so when we're stuck in, sta in, in cycles of stagnation, it's because he can't trust us. He can't trust us. Why? Why would he elevate you and bring you to a place of public embarrassment and shame? If he can't trust you, it's actually for your protection. Because you would fumble it so much so that it would bring so much humiliation that you might actually be suicidal because you can't handle what you're asking for. So instead of asking for more, 
Let's worry about being faithful. Let's worry about being faithful with what we have. Come on, Pastor Shaq talked yesterday about tools and talents. And I'm here to tell you, sometimes you got the tools and you got the talents, but you don't handle them with consistency. You don't handle them with maturity. You don't handle them well like there's something valuable and responsible in your hands. And so even then, you can't deliver. You can't be trusted. In my work, before I was an assistant superintendent, um, I was in another role, a deputy chief academic officer. And I say this to say, in that role, you really lead through influence. You don't really lead through power. I mean, you have a position, but, you know, the principles are principles that are building, just like apostles, pastor here. And so what is going to be controlled, the leader of their buildings really control. And so we did a training with our teams around uh, from this framework called the trusted advisor. Because if you need to be able to lead through influence, then you need to be able to be trusted. If people don't think you know what you're talking about, they're not going to do what you're saying. Point blank, period. So the model has an equation. Credibility plus reliability plus intimacy. And all those things can be diminished or divided by your self-orientation. So let's talk about credibility. Do you know what you're actually talking about? What have you done? What have you demonstrated? Where is the evidence? If people don't believe you know what you're talking about, then they won't trust you. If God sees that he gave you the tools and the gifts and the talents that you were born with and yet you don't do anything with them, then to God, you're not credible. To your leader, you're not credible. So maybe that's why the promotion you're hoping for hasn't come. It's because you have not shown reliability. This is where the consistency comes in. Do you have a follow-through problem? Follow-through. Meaning, if you're, if you're a person who's easily swayed by the tide, if you're easily swayed by how you feel, if you're easily swayed, then you can't be trusted to follow through. So if you don't follow through, why would God give you more? Intimacy. Curse word. Your intimacy with God is not to the level of which that you can get the mind of Christ to get the heart of Christ. And so if your intimacy with him is not there with him, if you have not prioritized spending time in relationship with him, how can you manage the things that you're asking him for, quite honestly? I'm just here to explain why we're stuck. Why we're stuck, we come to moments like this, we leave charge, we get all the downloads, all the strategies, all the technologies to go, and then we go back to our cities and they're unchanged. Homelessness still abounds, drug addiction still abounds, people still don't know God. And yet the church has people dancing around every single Sunday. So where's the breakdown? We're not stewarding well. Instead, we're too stuck on self. If it's convenient for me, does it fit into my schedule? Is it on my three-year plan, my five-year plan? The Lord is saying it's time to steward well. 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 Each of you are here because God has more in store for you. If, if your assignment was complete, you wouldn't be here anymore. And so the question is, do you want to leave prematurely before you have fulfilled the assignment? Or do you want to be faithful and carry it to full maturation? The Lord was giving me the analogy of when a woman gets pregnant since I have a seven-month-old. And I was thinking of all the preparation that goes into having a child. You act differently, and even your whole village, everyone around you begins to act different, right? You eat differently. Suddenly, when you thought your calendar was so full, you make time for all these hospital visits or doctor's office visits to make sure everything is doing well. People who maybe didn't have money find money to give gifts. You prepare a whole section of your house to care for them. But we don't put that same level of preparation 
of attention, of affection, of care and concern for the purposes, the visions, and the destinies that God has for us. And if you're like, well, I don't know what mine is, so maybe that's why I've been stumbling, because you're still fighting God on what he's telling you, then minimally I can tell you that our leaders... And the leaders in this front row, they are full. They are pregnant with purpose and destiny. And so, and we're not being good stewards of them. See, that's the problem. We're looking for our leaders to steward us. We also need to steward them. Stewardship is multidirectional. Stewardship is not just top down. God put you here because you have gifts and talents to contribute to the vision. And if the vision falters, it's as much our fault as the leader's fault. If you don't believe me, look at back in Exodus. What happened when Aaron and Miriam started getting full of themselves and saying, well, doesn't God talk to us? We we move in the spirit. We can do we can do signs and wonders. You to wait and talk to Pharaoh. What happened? God almost struck them dead because they were not being faithful stewards over the authorities that God placed in their lives. If Moses had interceded on their behalf, they would have died. Miriam literally got struck with the leprosy and kicked out of the, the uh, camp for at least seven days. And God really was just like, I'm ready to be done with him. And yet we don't have any fear to Pastor Boland's message last night. We don't have any fear when we open up our mouths and speak against. And, and here's the reality is, is sometimes your silence is worse than your words. Sometimes your inaction and inactivity says things that your words aren't even saying. Because if you have all these gifts and talents and you're sitting back there and nobody sees them on display, then what is the point? You have a key piece of the vision and yet you're sitting on your hands. You're not finding time to prioritize. And so you're not being faithful stewards over the leaders God has for you. Come on, we've all been there before, but just say it's time to steward well. I don't know about you. I don't want to abort the purpose of God. Come on, I don't want to I don't want to abort that purpose. I want to carry it to full term, to full manifestation, to full maturity. So God is grieved because when we look at the nation, its condition is a direct result of the church's lack of stewardship. And waiting for a select few to do the work the body, key word, body, limbs, hands, feet. How can two people, or even five people, if you want to include the prophetic cabinet, how can they reach the people that all of us can reach in our respective regions, in our respective jobs, on our respective blocks? And yet, how many times do you minister Christ to your neighbors? Do your people on your job even know that you are a Christian? It's time, it's time, it's time, it's time to steward well. And God is taking account. I don't know if y'all noticed how many um, spiritual leaders died in the pandemic. God is taking account. God is taking account. God is taking account, and sometimes we just lean too heavily on what we consider God is a gracious God. Yes, he is, but he is also a God of wrath. He is also a just God. He is also a holy God. And we can't ascend to the hill of the Lord without clean hands and a pure heart. So why are we not stewarding our hearts? When I looked up the word for steward that was in our text today, it's pronounced okonomia. What does that sound like? Okonomia. What does it sound like? Economy. Economy. It doesn't just sound like economy. It actually is the word that economy is derived from. I'm going to say that again. The word that means stewardship in Greek is actually the word in which our English language word called economy is derived from. And so maybe the reason that your economy is locked up is because you have not been faithful over the things of God. You're looking for abundance and overflow, but you haven't been faithful. There are principles to this thing. 
you reap what you sow. God is not going to break his principles. Our stewardship, root cause, root cause. Look for the things where there's been unanswered prayers. Look for the place where you've been in cycles. Look for the place where you, you just, I, I just don't understand why God is not bringing me through. We're here for the breakthrough. Root cause, stewardship. We are not stewarding well. It's time out where we're looking for somebody to make us hoop and holler and dance. I'm not that person. I'm not here to make you scream. I'm not going to make you maybe run around. But what I'm going to tell you is what the word of the Lord says. And he says, steward well. If you wouldn't do this on your job because you know you would be fired, why would you come into the house of the Lord and do it? The Lord has fired you. That is equivalently what has happened. There is no elevation, there is no promotion, there is no increase because you're not faithfully stewarding the things of God. Steward well. Steward well. Where has the reverence of God gone? Where has the fear, what is it about this? We think we can bring literally any old thing and God should just be happy that we showed up. Oh, I'm tired. It took so much to get here. I, Lord, I'm, maybe I'll raise my hands if they sing my favorite song. Or if it's the pastor is here, maybe I'll come to church today. Why are we not presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice? Holy and acceptable and pleasing unto our God. We're not stewarding. Well, come on, say steward well. Come on, say it until you believe it. I got to steward well. Steward well, wise stewardship is the key. Wise stewardship is what gives you access to God's economy. It's wise stewardship. I don't know about you, but in Philadelphia, we, we have a, a youth violence rate that is, I mean, it's, it's beyond us right now. He talked about Kensington where people are literally walking around with zombie, like zombies. I mean, it's normal. It's normal for kids to walk down the street and just be needles and everything all up and down the street. It's normal. We've been normalized to these things. When my school leaders get called about kids that are in the seventh grade, in the sixth grade, in the eighth grade, in the twelfth grade, they're numb to the deaths. They love deeply, but in a way they got to feel like they got to protect themselves because it happens so frequently. We've become numb, and the church is numb. Yeah. Why would we not? Why would we be able to turn on the news and look at? the state of our world and we're not grieved God is grieved we should be grieved if we're not grieved that means we don't have his heart if we're not grieved that don't mean that means we don't have his mind come on if we're not grieved that means we don't care about his will we have to steward well it's time out for this recklessness, this haphazardness, this mismanagement of the things of God, of the house of God, even our lives. You think about your physical body. What happens when you just eat any old way? Come on. I mean, I've been guilty. When you don't exercise. One of my friends last week had to have, she almost had a cardiac bypass at the age of 40. The church is in cardiac arrest. The church <clears throat> is in cardiac arrest. We have not stewarded well. We just let any old thing pass. Because we don't have God's heart and God's mind, we just follow any old leader that's shiny and glitzy. That's telling us what we want to hear, that makes us feel good. We don't have any discernment because we're, we don't have the heart of God. We don't have the mind of God. And so that's how we have this, this world right now where you can have people who are completely living in sin, have millions of followers, churches full, just overflow, and, and the pastor's not even serving God. But there's believers in the house. How do we miss it? How do we miss it? We're not stewarding well. We're not stewarding well. I 
I was I was studying and there were two other texts that were standing out to me. <clears throat> one was in Numbers and one was in Luke later with Jesus. And I have to talk about this because I'm a leader. And I so as a leader, I feel like if the leaders that I'm charged to manage, I manage principles, if they fail, I feel like I fail. There's no way that a school that I'm leading fails and I don't feel like a failure. I mean, just to be honest, I, I will 100% feel like there's something I could have done, there's something I missed, there's something I didn't see. How did we get here? And so I, I want you to go with me to Numbers. <clears throat> and we're going to be in Numbers 13. Because it's easy for us to look at the children of Israel and sort of know the outcome and skip over this major, this major moment. Numbers 13, verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip down. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. Skip down to verse 26. It says, now they departed. This is after being there for 40 days, seeing the promise of God. I mean, with us, a lot of times we hear the promise of God, but we don't actually get to preview the promise of God before it's time to walk in it. We just have to believe or stand on faith. But they, they literally went into the land and saw the promise that God said. And it says, now they departed and they came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them, to all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. They, they said, look, it's what God said it's going to be. Yeah. It flows with milk and honey. This is its fruit. Nevertheless. The people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified, and they are very large. And moreover, we saw some giants there. Come on. I mean, I'm, I'm reading this because you, how many, you back up from giants? Let's be honest. You back up from giants? When God is telling you clearly to step into a place of uncomfortability, into a new place, into an unfamiliar place, how many times do you move immediately? We back up from giants all the time, so let's not judge them. It says, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and let, said, let us go at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go. For against these people, they are stronger than we. And they gave a bad report. And later it says, we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. How, how do you know what, what, what you're like in their eyes? In fact, God had already been instilling fear. In every other nation because of how he delivered them from Egypt. But in their own eyes, they were like grasshoppers. So why, why am I reading this? I was thinking about, I mean, obviously we could think Moses was a powerful leader. He, he, he really did do a big thing. I mean, he was leading hundreds of thousands of people. This is not like a small group of people. He was leading hundreds of thousands of people. He did things that many leaders do. He appointed some leaders in each of the, in each of the tribes. But I, I just begin to question, how could we get to this moment where the leaders, not the congregants, the leaders went in, saw the promise, and then said, no, we can't. We can't go. We can't. We can't go. This made me think, what were the signs before we got to this moment that those leaders didn't have God's heart? What were the signs before they, he sent them off that they didn't have the heart of the leader? What are, were the signs that were missed that they were not willing to have audacious faith? What were the signs? Because there's no way we got to this moment and there were no signs. And so then I thought about in our, in our day and age, what are our signs that we don't have? God's heart and God's mind. Because the reality is, and I'm going to say this again, stewarding well first requires that we have the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the spirit of Christ. How do I know this? 
when David was being anointed and Samuel went, he was looking for the tallest, the most handsome. I mean, he went through all of them, even the oldest. I mean, he used every selection criteria we would use. And God said, no, I'm looking for my heart. I'm looking for my heart. He wasn't looking for how developed he was. He wasn't even looking for all the demonstrations at that point. He said, I'm just looking for my heart. And so if I think about what was the, what was the downfall that we need to think about as a prerequisite for stewarding well is, are, do we have the mind of Christ? Do we have God's spirit alive and working inside of us, or do we quench the spirit on a daily basis? I mean, to be honest, we got to give Moses a little grace because the reality is he didn't come in after Christ. He didn't come in the dispensation of Christ. And so these people were actually not filled with God's spirit. So there was a little bit of uh, an explanation. So what's our explanation? We literally have access to the indwelling power, authority, wisdom, revelation, and yet, we back up. We drop the ball. We fumble. We move with inconsistency. Because we're not diligent. We're not diligent about making sure that we have a level of intimacy with God consistently that cultivates his mind inside of us. And so we walk around, we have titles. Christian, believer, minister, deacon, elder, fill in the blank but they're without power. There's no power. There's no demonstration because we do not have the heart of Christ. Another thing that I realized that there was a downfall in this moment is that in addition to not having audacious faith, their yes was conditional. They said, we'll go in if we think we can have the victory. If. If. We'll go in if it looks like. But the reality is God had already secured it on their behalf. He's already secured it on our behalf, and yet still our yes is conditional. Conditional on our feelings, conditional on the weather. We're double-minded. And God says, get away from me if you're going to be double-minded because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The reality is in order to steward well, we have to have divine intelligence, divine understanding, divine wisdom, and yet we're not willing to have divine separation. You're looking for too many likes. I'm here to tell you the likes are not where God is taking you. So if you're looking for the likes, you might as well. He wants us to be set apart. Set apart. And I don't know what it is about this. Maybe it's the parent-child relationship. Something in our lives makes us think that this is just a top-down. Like, as long as they steward, I'm good. Just like your child, when they become grown, is not saved. Just because you're saved, neither are we. There's only so much you're going to experience. The full, in terms of the fullness of God, in terms of the abundant life that he has for us, when we're not faithfully stewarding the things of God. And so if our mission is to establish God's kingdom, then we have to think about this as a militaristic attack to take back the kingdom of God. Come on, to tear down the enemy's strongholds. Stuart well, come on, turn to your neighbor, just say, Stuart well. Come on, shake them a little bit. Because for some reason, for some reason, we can come to these moments. We can feel so in filled and rejuvenated and excited, and we leave. It's not about Sunday. It's not about these three days. If Apostle thought that we would come to these three days and all we would do was leave feeling good, I'm sure he would not waste his time, energy, or attention. <laughs> Steward well. And so I was thinking about then, what does it take for us to steward well? And 
for me, when I look at the children of Israel, the breakdown was in the leadership, to be honest. It made me think about how did Moses steward them? What, we never really saw many of the interactions between him and the elders, him and the leaders. And so I just want to give a few ways because as senior leaders and even as leaders in our churches, we have to lead through levels. There's only so many people that I can directly touch. And so if there's only so many people I can directly touch, then that means I have to steward the leaders God gives me with his wisdom and his guidance and his strategy. And so here are some things, and I'm not going to read the text, but in Luke 9, should you want to go, here are things that I saw Jesus did in his ministry consistently to steward his teams well. And when I say his teams, you have to think about this. Jesus had the one, John, he had the three. Peter, James, and John, he had the 12, he had the 70, and he had the masses. Some of us don't even have 70 people to steward well at all, I'm to be honest. And so he had to develop his leaders intentionally. So what do leaders do to steward well? First, they establish order. They establish order. We saw that Moses did this when Jethro came to him, and Jethro saw him judging all the people. He's like, why are you sitting there? judging all these people, you're going to wear yourself out. Jesus did the same thing. He established order. He put these uh, different ranks and positions here. Why? So that he knew there was only so many people he was going to come into contact with. He knew that his ministry on the earth was limited, and he knew that he needed to be carried out when he left. And so he put order into place. They put positions. They make sure that there's, they impart their authority. They give ownership of specific aspects of the work. They delegate. They don't hold on to it all. They establish order. Here's the pitfall. When you grow, you have to reassess the order. Because the structure that worked for 10 doesn't work for 100. The structures and order and systems that worked for 100, they don't work for thousands. And so as God is growing you, you still have to seek God for new wisdom, new insight, new understanding for what is the new structure in preparation for the increase. Not wait to the increase and see how it's falling and then add some structure. And so if we have the mind of Christ, then God will give us wisdom on how to increase the structure before the increase comes. Amen. Say they establish order. Next is they, they impart power. Again, God is not here for a powerless church. And so when Jesus came, it said he gave them authority. I'll give you authority to trample on scorpions and serpents and every other power of the enemy. And so good leaders, they impart their power. You see what Apostle was doing when he came and he laid hands. He's, he's giving us power. He's literally enduing his power. He's asked Pastor Autumn coming so that they can encapsulate us to infuse us with power. So when we go back to our regions, we're stronger. Come on, they impart power. The next thing is they lead through demonstration. Demonstration. I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to follow a leader that can't actually show me what they're talking about. So the demonstration is both in modeling, right? We saw Jesus go over and he was healing the sick. They were touching the hem of his garment. They were being healed. There's a reason he showed them, let's get the 5,000 here. We can, we can feed them just with a couple fish and a couple loaves. Why? He was showing them demonstrations so that when he left and after the church of Acts was formed and they were filled, when, when they were walking around, the people were like, oh, we can tell that they're uneducated, but we can tell that they were with Jesus. We could tell people were being healed in their shadows. Demonstration. And so good leaders that steward well, they, they lead their leaders through demonstration. They're not asking their leaders to do anything that they're not showing them how to do first. They demonstrate. Our God is a God of demonstration. That's why Elijah said, come on, y'all bring y'all prophets here. Come on, y'all, let's make it. Matter of fact, I'm going to put some water here. I'm going to dig uh, everything around it. I'm going to let y'all dance, cut yourselves, do all the things. Why? Because our God is a God of demonstration. He knew that our God would show up, that he would consume it as an all-consuming fire because he's a God of demonstration. Also, effective leaders, they steward well through clear vision. Excellent leaders, they are vision bearers. They don't see just for now. They see for later. And so it just made me to think about what happened when we just read about Israel. 
And Moses, what happened with the impartation of that visit, vision? What happened that it got stuck that they couldn't remember? They thought that actually slavery was better than what God was presenting to them. There had to be something that broke down in the impartation of the vision. Because a vision cannot live at just the level of the leader. There's a reason that they come up and they share the vision. They kind of paint the picture of where we're going, of what's next, not just what's now. Because the vision has to be carried out. Habakkuk said it like this, write the vision and make it plain that they may run and not faint. Who's the they? That's not you. That's the other people that read the vision, that people could pick the vision up, that they could carry the vision forward. And so effective leaders, they steward well by setting a clear vision. The last two components here is effective leaders, they uproot deception. They uproot deception. Effective leaders, they steward well because they, they look at the mind. They say, what is the lie? What is the stronghold that is holding this individual back, the people back? And they, they attack it at the root. They're not looking for the symptoms. They're not looking for why are you suicidal or why are you depressed? Why is your body sick and then ailing? Like, they look at the root, and they try to come at the root of the deception. You saw this through Jesus was going around. He was tossing tables. He was telling them we're looking at the outward man. We need to be looking at the inward man. He was addressing all the lies that the enemy had that was keeping what would be the church stagnant, the religious leaders of the time stagnant. And so effective leaders, they uproot deceptions. They're constantly looking for what is the lie that needs to be replaced, that is solidified in the strongholds that are bound and making people be bound and not be free. And effective leaders, they steward through attacking that deception. The last thing that effective leaders steward well is they steward by development. Development. In education, just like many other fields, it's like, I don't know what happened after the pandemic. All the people are gone. Ain't no teachers, ain't no bus drivers, ain't no nothing. <laughs> they all gone. I mean, they all disappeared. I don't I mean, ain't that many people could have died. I don't know where they went. <laughs> but the reality is, we mess up as leaders when we are looking for fully baked people to come along and lead alongside of us. Jesus wasn't looking for fully baked people. He had tax collectors. Come on. We're looking for fully baked. The, actual, the reality is actually better sometimes when people don't come fully baked because that's more deception and lies and fortified thinking that you have to uproot. And so sometimes the raw talent, the Peters, that you know is going to slice somebody's ears off and you have to rebuke them and correct them and move it on, you, they're better sometimes than the people that think that they know better. And so let me, let me just talk about development for just a half a moment before I sit down. Because the reality is when I say to develop, it's both through opportunities to stretch. So I've watched Apostle when he's like training the prophets. He gives like small micro moments, opportunities to stretch a little bit beyond your capacity. Just intentional moments to, to test the next place where he sees God is putting you. So there's opportunities to stretch. Jesus did this when he sent the 70. He put them in two by two for a little bit of insulation and protection. And he said, y'all going to go out there. Y'all going to try and y'all going to come back. But also, development doesn't come with just opportunities. So if you're just looking for an opportunity, you might as well go sit down because development comes with correction. Development comes with correction. It comes with critique. It comes with perfection. It comes with refining. And we saw this because Jesus sent the disciples in Luke 9 out. And then the guy came back and he was like, um, this demon is still tormenting my son. They did not effectively cast this demon out. And Jesus rebuked them and called them a faithless and perverse generation, even though he had just had so many other miracles. And so we think when we get corrected, oh, they don't really see. They don't see all the things I'm doing for God. Why are they correcting me? They're correcting you because if you spare the rod, you actually spare the child. And so correction actually is love. Correction is actually for your development. Correction is actually for your preparation. Because faithful leaders steward through intentionally developing their people and their leaders. Come on, just say steward well. Come on, just stand up all over the house. Steward well, steward well, steward well. Come on, just lift your hands. Just lift your hands. Father, 
we thank you, Lord, that you loved us enough to not open up the ground and consume us for our terrible stewardship. We thank you, Lord, that you decided not to take us out prematurely because of the many times that we've fumbled, that we've dropped the ball, that we have not operated in, in all that you've called us to, God. We repent right now. We repent, God, right now. We repent, God. We say, wash us, Lord. Wash us, Lord. Clean our hearts, Lord. Give us a heart that looks like your heart, God. Give us more of your spirit, more of your glory, more of your power, God. We repent, God, right now for our unfaithfulness for our inconsistency, for our lack of follow-through. Come on, we repent, Lord, that we have not handled your things with holiness, that we have not handled the things of God with sanctification. Come on, we repent, God, right now. Wash us, Lord. We're your servants. We're your children. God, and we want to be faithful stewards. We want to be faithful stewards so that everything in your kingdom is established, Lord. So God, give us your heart. Open up our minds and give us the audacious faith to believe. God, and right now I speak over every leader in the name of Jesus. God, I pray right now that you would give them clarity. God, clarity, Lord, in ways that they need to steward their teams well. God, help them, strengthen them, God, in ways they need to develop better, God, that they need to clarify their vision, God, that they need to enroll their teams in the, in the purposes, the plans of God. We pray right now that we would leave changed, that we would leave transformed, that we would leave more than just on fire, God, so that when we go back to our regions, God, that they would be disrupted, that they would be transformed, that your kingdom would be established. God, we thank you for this great privilege of having access to you. So God, we pray right now that you would endue us with your power. And do us with your strategy. And do us with your wisdom. God, that we would steward well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.